you arguably wrote really, really arguably wrote the most important book about food ever. Um, it's great to have a 50th anniversary issue. Those of us old enough to have been there um, and be reading, remember the, the original 1971 edition uh, as incredibly important then, and it remains important now. Um, you've, in a way, moved on from food, not that you don't think it's important, but you don't focus on food as much. And I wanna to get to that, but everybody needs to hear the story, um, which you tell so beautifully of how you came to write Diet for a Small Planet. And I'm sure everyone here is curious to hear it. So um, I will set the stage. It is the late 60s, 1970 in Berkeley. And there you are, I think we can safely say a 20 something. Indeed, I was 26 and I had been born in a sense in this magical time where we really felt government represented us and I had been part of the war on poverty mark. I'd gone to Philadelphia and I'd worked you know, door to door to organize a welfare rights organization, a little chapter. And I really was, uh, it was, such a time of possibility. But I did get to Berkeley then. My husband was a postdoc, and so I had access to everything, the library and everything, but I continued in community organizing until one moment <laughs> I woke up one morning and said, hey, wait a minute, I can't do anything else to try to save the world um, until I understand, you know, how did we get here? How did we get here? And I was really terrified of stopping, you know, because I didn't know where I would go. But um, at the time, um, at the time, those of you of my generation might remember, it was the time when Paul Ehrlich's bomb, the population bomb, had just exploded, and people were terrified that we really had reached the Earth's limits. And I remember this image of the Earth with people falling off of it because there just wasn't enough for anyone. And so the light bulb went on, Mark, and I said, "Aha, food! That is it. It is the most basic of all our needs." And if we're not getting that right, what else matters? It's, is it true that we really run out? And so I took my dad's slide rule, which I still have, if any of you know what it is, <laughs> young, <laughs> younger than my generation. Um, I still have it, yep. I went to the library and the ag library and I started putting the numbers together and I said, oh my gosh, <laughs> there's more than enough. And the amount of built-in waste is unbelievable. And here we're talking about, we're hitting the limits? No, 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 no. We humans, we are creating the experience of scarcity for millions and millions, but there is no need for that. And so Mark, I really thought that, you know, I just had to share this great news, right? Because it flew right in the face of all this fear. And I said, oh, if we created hunger, then we can end hunger, great message. <laughs> and so I wrote a one page handout, but then I said, you know, you should really know a little bit more about this. And so I turned that into a booklet that then got into the hands of one of the founders of paperback publishing in America, Betty Ballantyne. And that was the beginning. And Betty said, yo, if you couldn't write it, I could do that. That's what she said to me many years later. <laughs> she just liked my ideas. And she, truth be told, Betty had the idea for the recipes. And I think she was brilliant in that. And so I went to work just soliciting all my Berkeley friends and suggesting recipes that I would then tweet because then that, well, that's a whole other story, but I had to, I felt I had to really do something fancy dancy with the protein balancing. So that was it, Mark. I just really wanted to tell people that this was in our power, that we were creating this needless, needless uh, suffering in the world and we could change it. And yeah, I could go on and on all night on that question. Oh, you're welcome to. Um, the population, so-called population control was a big issue back in the 60s. And um, Paul Ehrlich, like his predecessor, um, Robert Malthus, was well-intentioned and, mm -hmm. and, um, and really believed that one of the answers to ending suffering um, was a reduced population. Uh, yet population, of course, has continued to grow. And that, that challenge has 
remains with us. But I, you know, I think that, or I know that you and I agree that uh, numbers of people on the planet is not the problem. Um, the fact that there are seven and will be 10 billion people here is, is a challenge we can meet. And yet the arguments are constantly, I mean, you must get them as often as I do. None of this matters if we don't reduce population. None of this matters if we don't reduce population. I don't think we need your slide rule or your dad's slide rule, <laughs> but I think it's an interesting question to say, how do we know that there's enough food? How do we know that we can actually, that everyone can feed themselves on earth? Well, let me just say a couple of facts here that we do know that per capita, the food supply is about almost 3000 calories per, that's man, woman, child, almost 3000 calories. And that's more than enough than most of us need by far. But also Mark, the key thing that just blew me away was that we think of ourselves, you know, we're the modern, we're the modern, you know, mechanized scientific kind of agriculture, but what? You mean that, yes, it's true. We use about 80% of our agricultural land for um, production of livestock. That includes grazing, of course, about 80% of our agricultural land. And we get from livestock about 18% of our calories. So just on that alone, Mark, it's just so clear that we have incredible wiggle room to improve our efficiency through a plant and what I've come to call now a planet, plant and planet-centered diet, because of course the threats are, that our food system poses go way beyond you know, the scarcity scare or our, even our own health to the very violation of nature. And um, so that, that was where I, I, I called in the first edition, I called what we created a protein factory in reverse that it was so shocking that we took all this abundance and then reduced its capacity to feed us. And so that's, that's my, and in terms of population, I do believe, and I, I'm curious if you would agree with this, Mark, but I, I think you would, that, that slowing population growth is, is, is in many places a desire uh, for, you know, for many people, and it has to do with the empowerment of women, and that as we have societies that are more fair, more equitable, including in food uh, access, that then that is the way that we can slow population growth as we integrate our societies healthfully into our ecosystem. So it's not, it's not, a, it's not a contest. It is the very roots to end hunger also uh, bring population growth to a halt because there are many countries now, as you know, that are below re replacement level and most population growth continues where women are most disempowered in certain countries in, in Africa and in certain um, regions of India and Pakistan, and that's it. I think what, what we've seen and what we continue to see is that as um, education improves for girls and, and those girls become women and those women are empowered, um, then population control is no longer an issue. And as you, as you say, we're, there are, there are concerns about replacement, replacement yes. levels of population in much of the world. Although I don't, yeah, I don't think that's a, so much of an issue. Um, the, when you talk to people about plant-based diet or increasing uh, the proportion of plants in their diet, the first question, 90% of the time, the first question that you get is, how will I get enough protein? That's something that you addressed 50 years ago, and yet it remains, um, I don't mean to be insulting, but many people remain ignorant to the fact that all foods contain protein, all foods contain carbohydrates, and all foods contain fats, just in different proportions. So to call animal products protein, as so many people do, is really a, a major PR and marketing success for the animal production industry. Because we can get protein from spinach, we can get protein from rice, we can get protein from any legitimate uh, plant source or animal source, of course. 
Um, how's that changed or, or not changed in the last 50 years? Well, I do think that, that there is definitely some evolution in the general understanding. And in some ways, I think that, you know, that I also in 1970, when I was writing that I was very concerned. And, and one of the things that people told me at the time is, oh my gosh, your book helped peace in my family because really my parents thought I would die if I didn't eat meat, I'd die from protein deficiency, right? So I really paid a lot of attention to making clear that all these foods have protein in them. And of course, we also, as you know, Mark, at that time, there was this, um, under the, the science told us that we could get more usable protein by what they call protein complementarity. And I thought that was really cool. And because most traditional diets, you know, throughout the world, whether it's lentils and rice in India or corn and beans in Latin America, that people that were making these combinations. And I thought it was really cool that you get more usable protein that way. Now we know, of course, that, that it doesn't matter. We'll get enough regardless. You don't have to be a chemist in the kitchen. I kind of like that idea that I was, but you don't have to even think about it. And that, that the kicker takeaway from what we're saying, I think, is that Americans eat about twice the proteins their bodies can use, right? And just be sure, you know, you don't store protein to use as protein. If you eat more than you can use, it's just stored like any other carb or any other fat. So there's no benefit for to, to over consuming protein. So basically what we've learned since Diet for Small Planet, relax about it, you're fine. And that if you eat healthily, you are covered. And it, that means a whole you know, range of things. And because I think a lot of people who eat in the plant world know that, that nuts have a lot, legumes, peas, beans, and lentils, that is, have a lot. So, um, but you're right, everything has a little. And in the back of the new edition, we have a chart just underscoring that, you know, how, how the wide variety of things that you can, um, that all have protein. So it's just take a deep breath and you don't have to worry about it. Um, so that's the that's the key. Um, I think it's it's might be worth saying that I'm going to say it even if it's not worth saying I guess but legumes <laughs> are the world's most important source of protein by a long shot, um, and whole grains of course are the most important source of calories. So um, it is true that there has been no society that has become moneyed or affluent where people haven't eaten more meat up until now, but we know that that has to change. Um, one thing I said, I started to say 15 years ago is that it's not as if we need to support the Chinese eating more like Americans, we need to support more Americans eating like the Chinese. And yet things have gone in the wrong direction in that in that period, the world is eating more and more and more meat. Right. Um, go ahead. Well, I think that represents that that's one way to see the increasing inequality of wealth in the world. That the people who are rising to the top, it's a status food, but it's also more expensive food because of all that we have to devote, resources we devote to get it. So sadly, it is one sign of our world that's grown increasingly unequal, unfair, unjust. I was going to, thank you. I was going to say um, some of this has, has paralleled your evolution, your personal evolution. And, um, you know, I will say without being overly flattering that I've admired um, what you've done since the 70s and in a way have always sort of felt 10 years behind you and still do, um, even though we're roughly the same age. Um, <laughs> nevertheless, I'd like to hear a little bit about your evolution, not away from food, but from de-emphasizing food and emphasizing, not to steal too much of your thunder, but emphasizing basically democracy. Yeah. Um, and that's where you've gone in the last 50 years, and that's where you are now. And I'd like to spend the rest of our time talking not so much about food. Everybody should, of course, go buy a diet for a small planet. But um, let's talk about what can fix food, which is not a direct address of food, but of society at large. Uh-huh. Thank you. 
Yeah, I I have. I've learned, though, I like my new metaphor of, you know, the Gerald Ford, uh, we used to say he can chew gum and <laughs> walk, walk at the same time, <laughs> walk and chew gum, right? Well, I, I've got two feet and I do this dance. I've done my democracy food dance with, on both my feet because I do feel I, I get emotional when I talk about food because I do feel that food is so special and has such power. You know, I learned that that the word companion comes from uh, with pan, with bread. Um, and mm -hmm. so breaking bread together is our, is, is, is our connection with others. And so it has this deep emotion to it and it ties us to everything, you know, to the earth, all the organisms under and over the ground and, and um, to our own, you know, to our own health and our own moods. I mean, it's just so powerful. So I never can let go of my food <laughs> journey I can never do that but I also and some but I you know I've had to say okay you're just going to do this you know uh, I've had to like really talk myself into it uh, that you are going to talk about what do you mean when you say Frankie that hunger is not caused by scarcity of food it's caused by scarcity of democracy okay and what are you going to do about that because if the first thing that every other species does, right, is feed itself and feed its offspring. And we haven't succeeded in that. <laughs> and I think it's because we haven't learned yet what are the ways that we make decisions together that bring out the best in our species and meet our most basic needs. I mean, it's we're so bright, but we haven't figured it out. And that way for me is democracy, which I define as three elements. It is the dispersion of power, it is transparency in public affairs. We know what happens when things are secret. It's, I mean, I could give, of course, a million examples of that. Uh, so dispersion of power, so we all have a voice, is first, then transparency. And the third condition that I define as definition of democracy is what I call mutual responsibility, that we are all, some are guilty, but all are responsible. Those are words of Rabbi uh, Abraham Joshua Heschel. Um, so I, I um, decided about, oh gosh, in the early 90s, I moved to create the Center for Living Democracy in Vermont, which, you know, this idea that democracy is not a, um, a state, it is a being, it is a doing. And, and that is, I've woven that into my life since then. And uh, my last book with a person, uh, 49 year, years my junior, Adam Eichen, is called Daring Democracy, and it's about really living democracy. And uh, so, yes, you're right, uh, Mark. I think we, we have to find ways to realize that our current, our current economic and political system violate not just the heart in our bodies, but the heart in our souls, because it fails to meet our most basic needs for power for meaning and connection with others. And, and it just violates everything about our humanness to see people suffering from hunger around us when we know that it's needless. So I, 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 just, um, I, I just can't uh, choose, you know? I think that, that I'm always peeling away the layers and trying to see where the touch points in, uh, and, and that's what the way I describe it in the, new opening chapter of the book. And I talk about the democracy movement. And I'm proud to say that, um, you know, this walking on the food movement and the democracy movement at the same time, that my little small planet Institute teamed up with a giant organization. It represents 45 million Americans. Um, and it is a democracy initiative, it's called. It's a coalition of many groups. And we've created together a website that's just a simple jump into it website called democracymovement.us. And there, it's, a, it's an action hub where you can see what's going on in your state. It has a map, you know, you can jump to your state and see how you can get engaged. And so I, um, I could go on and on about uh, the democracy work that, I, that uh, I think is so critical. A lot of it is just awakening Americans to how uh, corrupted our democracy is. I just, I'll, I'll end this little, section just saying that most people think, oh yeah, you know, we're not quite as good as Western Europe. Uh, 
that doesn't begin to tell the story that uh, we are rated by international, very credible international surveys that do in-depth studies of democracies around the world. We're related, we're rated below about 50, uh, right down, you know, we're right in there with Mexico and, and we're, you know, just not up at the top at all. And the same with our level of inequality. We're, we're right there with a monarchy, you know? So I, I, part of what I've been trying to do with my life is to motivate myself and others by just helping to, to dispel some of the myths about the quality of our democracy and really encourage us to see, okay, how are other people getting money out of the system? And we can do it too. I mean, one other statistic about American exceptionalism is we also um, have gone from third in the world in longevity to, I think it's 42nd. Um, and all of these things track together, of course. Equality yeah. leads to more democracy, leads to longer lifespans, leads to better health. Yes. Um, I sometimes get befuddled, confused. I'm not sure what they're frustrated, I guess is the right word. Um, because talking about food always leads to conversations about democracy, about society, about equality, about in the United States, the way that this country was, was founded, organized, uh, the way wealth was distributed, uh, the way land was given away, uh, stolen and then given away. Um, the question is, when you recognize that it's hard to deal with food, you can deal with food on a personal level whenever you want to, but to deal with food on a societal level, you really have to begin to address issues of democracy. So um, I'm, I'm wondering if you can give some examples of the way that the two intersect and then the way that people, um, can begin to act in ways that will improve not only food, but life. Well, there's so many, I mean, when we think about the level of harmful chemicals that we use and the power of corporations to keep those going in our food system, um, it's, it's stunning. There are 20 corporate lobbyists for every single person in Washington, for every person that you and I have elected to represent us there. And uh, many of those work for the very corporations that are keeping alive uh, the very destructive methodologies and putting the subsidies in the wrong places, not toward the growth of organic, not toward the, the, um, um, you know, the, the practices of ecological agriculture, which we could be supporting with our tax dollars, but rather allowing the continuum monopoly control within the food sector. As you know, you know, there are four or so corporations at sort of every level that have dominant power. And um, so with more democracy, we can begin to, uh, one, create rules that don't allow that kind of influence over our policymakers. That's certainly very clear to me. I mean, I remember reading about Michael uh, Taylor, wasn't it, in the Obama administration and, and on that he cycled, I think, three times. FDA um, official, yep. Yeah, and and was a you know a clear supporter of uh, the uh, genetically modified seeds that are dependent on a very dangerous chemical glyphosate, which has been really restricted in so many countries, but not here because again the power of private interests. So um, I, I think that that's that piece of. Um, really learning from what other, other societies are doing and keeping, you know, that having public financing of elections back in my youth, or at least younger years, um, uh, Jimmy Carter ran with uh, a lot of public money and won with a lot of public financing. So just, I love to remind people that it's not always been as corrupted as it is today, that we've had periods where we have know, really made huge strides, in, including in, in anti-poverty, which definitely helped in terms of people being having access to healthy food. So I, I think that, that a, a good part of it is what we can do to, on the most basic questions of voter um, um, 
um, voter access and freedom to vote and ease to vote and, and really educating voters in that process and how that our, if our voices are listened to, um, that um, that piece of it to, to end gerrymandering, which we know is a huge problem. And uh, in terms of um, just, um, you know, the, the, the basics, those sorts of basic fundamentals of, and that's why this, this website that I'm, I'm excited about that we've launched, it, you know, it, it outlines that, that, that those pieces. And I'm just so pleased that um, there are many angles that one can come into depending on where we live and what level that we want to get involved. So um, uh, I think that's what, you know, that, that I, I just keep coming back to the fact that in, in, in my youth up until the 1970s, there were very few uh, lobbyists in Washington. And from 1970 or so onward after the famous Powell memo, when this was the roadmap for free enterprise to, as it called itself to, to defend itself, that the, the firms with lobbyists in Washington leapt 14 fold in 11 years. So, you know, that just, I just, we just saying that because it just underscores how it doesn't have to be this way. Um, and um, we, we have to build strong political parties that are listening to us. And another thing that's happened in our, our funding of elections is that parties, that it's individuals who are the individual rich families have increased their funding so much more than political parties have actually. I'm just learning that. that, that um, so that's weakened the influence. And for example, the Koch brothers network of, of funders is, uh, is by some standards anyway, a scholar at Harvard likens it to the depth, the breadth of the Republican party. So we can, as we engage with democracy, we can just say, no, sorry, that's just not, we're gonna expose it. That is that transparency piece of democracy. And we're, we're going to put boundaries on, on money and politics um, that other countries have and take for granted. So I, I don't have an easy formula, but I just want to underscore that in my life, at least, <laughs> it's been a very, very thrilling process. You know, we think often of, de of, of democracy as a dull duty, you know, voting is the dull duty that we do to get our dessert of personal freedom. And I've just personally discovered the joy, I call it the thrill of democracy, and I talk about it in the book that way, because it's just that taste of power. And I, I just, I'll, I'll stop in just one second, but uh, I marched from watching, I watched, I marched from Philadelphia to Washington DC for democracy reforms, the same ones that are now pushing forward in Congress, but this was in 2016. And I didn't think I could walk 10 miles, Mark. <laughs> and I walked and there was a moment in which we were approaching the Capitol and I saw the dome and I literally started weeping. And I thought, oh my gosh, they work for me. Those folks in those buildings, they work for me. And if we can keep that spirit of, wait a minute, you know, <laughs> we citizens in a democracy are the people who are supposed to have the voice. And unless we stand up to demand it, and there's so many positive things that are happening state and locally um, on this score that it's not going to happen. And so I like to tell, yes, I do, in the book too, you know, just tell stories of where people have stepped up who you never have would have expected and create enormous change. And um, so I think, well, I could go on and on. So why don't I let well, you I'm gonna <laughs> ask you, I'm gonna ask you about a couple of those stories in a second. Um, we are going to take questions from the audience. And if you have one, I would ask that you please put it in the chat box, which you'll find at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, there's a there's a little uh, voice bubble called chat. Just click on that and type your question in there, and we will take them in just a few minutes. Um, and Mark, I want to say I see a few names of my friends out there, so I would love it if people who are my friends would ask questions. 
Okay, thank One you, of them is, Go. Is, is smiling right now, so. Um, I love, it's very hard for most people to work on a national level, but it's actually very easy for most people to work on a local level, or if not easy, certainly doable. I wonder if you'd share a couple success stories of people who are working on democracy in their, in their regions or neighborhoods. Well, one who is just, I have to mention is, and you can go even tonight and find the movie, it's called um, Slay the Dragon about a young woman named Katie Fahey, who, do you know the story, Mark, about Katie Fahey in Michigan? She was in her early twenties and she just said, wait a minute, this, this gerrymandering is crazy in our state. I've got to do something. And she put a notice on her Facebook page and guess what? And she thought a few friends might get involved and it was just turned into thousands and thousands of people that got across. And, and she organized this tour around the state where they met in libraries and discussed this and, and got all sorts of ballots uh, voting uh, set up for a, an amendment that, uh, or, you know, that would require an independent, uh, an independent commission to set the set the district lines and she won she won wow. <laughs> and the movie is fan fantastic it it it, it it's uh, not like a typical documentary it's really get you get you emotionally and then i love that story and then one of my heroes also another young woman is um chloe maxman maxman she graduated from harvard where she worked really hard to get harvard to divest from fossil fuels and she wanted to live in her hometown in Maine. And so she ran for office in the, one of the most conservative districts anywhere. And um, she won on a Green New Deal platform and is just plowing ahead. So, um, you know, I, I, um, it's not possible to know what's possible is one of my favorite reminders to myself that, that humans don't need a certainty of success, but in, and in a world in which everything is a continuous change, everything is connected, um, then um, it's not possible to know what's possible. So go for it. And this is the, the thrilling, I think the thrilling part of, of democracy because what will happen as one engages in the ways that, that um, you know, I did when I did my little march, but um, you meet people who you would never meet otherwise. And similarly as Katie, and all those people working to pass that gerrymandering reform, uh, meeting people they would never have met otherwise. And that's gotta be thrilling to, to realize that people with totally different walks of life, oh, they care about what you care about. And so that's, that's really takes us out of our glumness and into connecting. And it's such a deep human need. Um, the examples you've given about improving democracy have been, or about organizing to, to improve democracy have been about directly about politics, about democracy. One of my um, concerns over, over the years has been that food is not a great organizing issue. And um, I have my own feelings about that. I have my own thoughts about that. I wonder whether you agree, and if you don't, what you think, and if you do, why you think that is? Why don't people take food that seriously? Gosh, maybe I just meet people who take it very seriously. <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess I do. Um, I, I just find that people are horrified and just so motivated when they realize that we've turned our food system into a health threat. That, um, that you know, just to throw out what a lot of you must know, but I, think most people don't, that 60% of the calories that people are eating have zero nutrition in them. And that 20% and that, um, of, the, of the meat that we eat is processed meat. And yet the World Health Organization has declared it a carcinogen. And red meat itself is a probable carcinogen. And so I, I think that there's a lot of upset uh, by people as they are learning how, how harmful, how, how much it violates our bodies and just violates our our sensibilities uh, to know our how suffering at this like what is it half of farm workers are poisoned every year <laughs> and you know that the the knowledge that these these chemicals that 
we are using in agriculture are actually harmful to our bodies and yet they're still being used. It That's a to me a real motivator. I don't see people not motivated. It's it's really, uh, I think just a challenge to, to be able to, to make those connections to, as I was saying, walk on two feet, you know, of, of keeping our, our, our food connections and educating ourselves and others, and then realizing that only as we organize and, and really get democracy that answers to us, can we make sure that the private interests aren't dominating our public decisions. That I, I love to remind people that the preamble to our constitution says that a purpose of our very nation is to promote the general welfare, promote the general welfare, right? And how do we do that unless we engage in a way and remove the power of private interest from its core role now? And um, this idea that America was founded just for us all to do our own thing, oh no, 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 the general welfare. You know? So I, I love to just sing that song. That's what society is for, is, is exactly that. And um, yeah, it's about recognizing what food is for and why food is important and, and who's got the power over what we eat. I mean, a lot of these are power issues, a lot of what you're talking Absolutely. about. Absolutely. Power is, you know, it's from the root of posse in Latin, it's just to be able to have a voice. And it, it's what everyone needs. We're not you know, I, I just try so hard, you know, to, to, to figure out, you know, how to just honor that need for people to have a voice. It's not, you should, you should, it's, it's honoring this deep, deep need and giving people ways to, to fulfill their need for voice and, and meaning and connection in our lives. And, and I just do feel that food has that special power because even if we can't articulate it very well, everybody knows that our food is what connects us to everything on earth. And it is what, you know, has historically been a source of joy, the breaking of bread together, as I was saying, the word companion. And yet that same source of joy has been in turned into such a harm, a violation for, for our bodies. And that's that should be really get people jumping out of their chairs. And it does more and more, I think. So that's, that's where I am now and, and just, the response, just getting back into the, the the writing of the chapter, convinced me even more that that you know that the democracy, food, marriage is is just a natural one, a holy one. I'm going to get to people's questions in a second, but one one more back to back to a straight food question, which is how should people eat? Do you do you recommend that people be vegetarians or or what do you think people should do in their personal lives? Well, I think the evidence is whether it's our climate impact um, or species preservation, saving the rainforest, which is so central for species as well as climate change, all of these, these things, and down to just fundamental justice um, um, that uh, I, I like the shift away from vegetarian to plant centered and to plant and planet centered now for me. And I think that that is, is a broader umbrella, you know, a wider uh, and more embracing that it's not saying that people never touch it. I mean, personally, I, you know, for me, give, giving up meat was never a, a challenge. I just, just, it was all about discovery and I just felt so much better, you know, so I don't feel I have to, to sacrifice anything and I just love it to eat in a plant world. But I think that big tent approach of just saying, welcome, welcome. Um, it's, it's, that's where the variety and the texture and the color and all of that is and to try to really eat as organic as I can. So I, I, uh, I think that uh, as people make all those connections with um, human well-being of farm workers, for example, and and just the inefficiency of a meat-centered diet and climate impact of a meat-centered diet. I should say, I haven't thrown this out yet, that uh, scientists now tell us that as much as 37% of greenhouse gas emissions could um, be coming from our food system. And that uh, one scientist calculated that 
if we all turn to um, you know, a plant-centered, a plant -centered, not necessarily vegetarian, but plant-centered diet, that would be the equivalent of taking all the automobiles and boats and trains and all off, off the planet. I mean, that would, that would be equivalent to, to ending that pollution, uh, that climate heating. So I think there's every good reason, you know, and it's not a finger wagging that I feel when I say that it's a welcome to the joy and to the satisfaction of knowing that we, uh, as by spreading plant-centered eating, plant and planet-centered eating, that that uh, there's so many positive ripples. So it's a, a lot of the questions. A lot of the questions in the chat have to do with exactly that and individual diets and individual recommendations and and variations in diet among individuals, can you generalize and say um, a plant-centered diet, a diet that gets most of its calories for plants is what's best for people, best for the planet, best for everything really? I, I think there's a lot of evidence. I mean, just in terms of, you know, what I was saying about um, processed meat being now the declared carcinogen, meat being probable, uh, that a vegetarian diet has, oh, like plant, excuse me, <laughs> I've got to watch my own mouth. A uh, plant sitter diet is associated with longer, uh, with longevity um, and um, with uh, certainly in terms of the diabetes uh, situation that it is most helpful. Um, it, almost half of Americans are now either pre-diabetic or diabetic. I just learned that recently, and and a uh, plant-centered diet is very very healthy, um, and has helped people. I, I got I describe in the chapter how I got a, ca a call from the office of Eric Adams, you know, in, in New York, who uh, told me that he um, had diabetes so bad that he was losing his eyesight, and that he moved to a plant-centered diet, and he just uh, got over diabetes and his eyesight returned and I kind of thought it was too good to be true. I didn't right. really. <laughs> and evidently there, there is quite a bit of science about um, evidence um, that uh, this plant-centered diet is very, very good for uh, helping people with diabetes. So I just think there's everything to gain. <laughs> and plus the, the kind of exploration factor, you know, that, that in the plant world, there's so many possibilities. You can just wing it you know you can just try different things and put different things together and so i always want the recipes in my book to be just to spark people you know i don't want people to feel a slave that to the recipes that's anna i want to give my daughter a huge a shout out here because she was the one who really helped organize and we had great input from and great contributions from fantastic chefs including mark and <laughs> and um and uh, all the, I want to underscore also that she made sure that all the recipes got brought up to the 21st century. <laughs> because, I was going to say all the recipes have been either, are either new or been redone, right? Yes, yes, yeah. And they're, they're this really spruced up. I want to give credit to Wendy Lopez, the recipe developer who went through and test, tested them all and, you know, tweaked them when they need tweaking. And my daughter still teases me. She says, Mom, did you know that in your original book you had 70 recipes with margarine? <laughs> because we had bought the scare thing about, you know, we, I, this is a longer story, but uh, it was very much the period where, oh, animal fat, no, we need to reduce that. So margarine is better. But I had to be very pleased that that got out of the recipes. <laughs> I, um... I will say that I remember the book more for its content than its recipes. I could, I think I can say that, but the new ones are great. Um, oh, thank you, thank you. Here's a really interesting question from Alex, who says uh, she first saw you speak at the DC Green Festival and you were amazing. And her question is, could you comment on the role of race in both the population control movement of the 80s and 90s and the current historic voting rights movement? There's oh, a thank you. question thank for you. you. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I, I just feel that, that uh, the way forward, the way forward 
is through this recognition that we are one absolutely uh, and, and, and that the, the Black Lives Matter movement has given so much life to our, to our common understanding of how social change can, can occur in, in a very positive way. And so I, I, I feel that um, one of the things I'm glad too is to recognize how many you know, more in the, in the new book, you know, the contribution of indigenous um, 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 cuisines to this uh, world that we need to be moving toward, that that, that is the, the celebration. And Brian Terry, for example, contribute the black um, uh, uh, recipes from the African-American culture. In um, so I, 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 and of course, the other part of this is because of our extreme inequality and the role of racism, that it is the it is people of color who are, have suffered the most from our degraded diet because the lack of access to the healthier foods and um, the extreme inequality that is so race connected that it makes it harder to buy healthy food. So for all those reasons, and that's why I highlight in the book, um, the work of the Soul Fire Farm and Leah Penniman in upstate New York. And it was just so moving when I talked to her. She has a farm there, not too far, I guess, from, not too far from where you are, Mark, um, that um, helps um, um, people of color, Blacks, um, in particular from the African uh, continent, you know, people coming who can embrace the roots of uh, what African traditions. And so she describes how her great grandmother brought in a slave ship. She, she wove seeds into her hair to take that culture with her to the new world. And I was just, just so touched by that. But, but Leah is successfully, you know, a lot of the people who come through there do become, if not farmers, at least gardeners. And, and, and uh, it's just such a powerful um, contribution. And then there, there are a number of groups that are working for black farmers to get the, you know, that, that I wish I had the statistic in my head, but that the assault, the assault on black farmers over the decades where they had a significant percentage of our farmland and now it's just minuscule. From 2 million to 50,000. Oh, it's, it's amazing. And, and asking for uh, a real reckoning with that stolen land. Um, and so I hope that that um, you know that that can move forward as well because that I, I think it's more in the consciousness now than it was before. And I was glad to in include the, the Leah story in the book. A um, couple of things. Leah's book is called Farming While Black. It's it's terrific. And here's Brian's book. Oh, good, good, good. Uh, anyway, the most amazing cover of the year. I'm sorry that my Zoom is screwing it up. Right, anyway, and here's, yeah, I want to mention one more time, here's, this is terrible. <laughs> here's your book. Um, anyway, the image is displayed better behind you, and it is for sale online tonight. Um, one last question. And that is how you think things have changed in the last 50 years for better or for worse and in both food and democracy. Oh, there's a small question mark. Well, we'll wrap it. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, gosh. Um, well, I mean, 50 years ago, we, as I say, were locked in this, in this, you know, just fear, just fear. And I, I still think that in some ways we are still trapped in, in, in fear and um, fear that has evolved, but there was just fear of absolute scarcity. Today, perhaps it is more fear that we don't know how to corrupted and broken democracy and, and economy. I mean, it is the most brutal form of capitalism that we're now suffering from. And so I, I don't have a, a formula, but I do know that we learn from one another. We, we learn from story, from other stories that can say to us that is, <laughs> you know, that 
it's not possible to know what's possible, my, what I was saying before. And so therefore, let us, let us open to what possibility we see. And I, I often say to my, of myself, and, and I think it's true for all of us, that, that it's, change is difficult because we are such pack animals that to, we're, we're, we're not too individualistic, I think, we're, we're really pack animals. It's really hard to break and to do something different with different people that you've never known before. And so I really, for myself, what's really worked is associating with people who are gutsier than I am, like those on the march, you know, people who are trying new things. Um, and, and because we're social, we'll become more like them and, and, and do what we thought we could not do. And so I'm just hoping that um, that's a spirit in which I'm trying to, to open to new possibilities and, and, um, and offer them in the book through, through a number of stories about people who have done just that, done what they thought they could not do. So I don't have a short answer to your question. I didn't really answer your question that what's, what's harder. I think maybe it's a combo. We know so much more now about how all of these harms are connected. Um, the assault on, the, on nature and the assault on our bodies and the assault on our psyche in terms of being feeling powerless, uh, our system making us feel powerless. And I think that's what has changed. I think back in, in my youth, there was more of a sense that we could come together and, and um, revolutionize. And I think that that's still, um, it's still possible to have that, that new confidence that perhaps coming out of the darkness of the pandemic and the climate crisis right in our face and knowing that food is a pathway to help heal the, the planet in terms of climate change, maybe all of that can help us to try what we, you know, what we had never tried before and to uh, really seek out new connections with others that, that stretch us. That's, that's what I'm hoping for. And that's what I hope every day for myself. <laughs> so. Um. That's beautiful. I think you're so wise. I, we'll leave with that, but you're, you're so full of wisdom. I, I will um, recommend that people um, look at and buy the new edition of Diet for a Small Planet, but I also want to recommend that people check out my favorite book of yours, which is called Get a Grip, and which is really could be called Wisdom from Francis Moore LePay, which you are full of. And um, I'm so happy to have spent this time with you. Um, thank you all for coming. I actually hope to see many of you next month at my 92nd Street Y event, but thanks for coming to this one. And Frankie, good luck with the book and hope oh, to see you soon. thank you, Mark. You're wonderful. And I'll, I want to come to your event. Okay, so thank you. Thank you all. Okay, good night. Good night, everybody.